Hello, everyone, and welcome to Tips for Improving Student Retention with Blackboard. My name is Stephanie Richter, and I'm the Assistant Director of the Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center at Northern Illinois University. I'm really excited for all of you who are joining me today and all of you watching the archive later. I want to start with some bold claims about retention. And I call them bold claims because I'm not going to support them right now. I'm not going to try to convince you. This is sort of the, um, I'm a math person. So from my math background, these are the axioms that build what our discussion will cover today. The first one is that student retention is important. Certainly here at NIU, we've been hearing a lot about retention lately. Uh, and it's really no different in higher education in general. The, what we can do to encourage our students to continue in their studies and remain part of the university is important regardless of where you are right now. The second bold claim is that there are many factors that affect retention. There is no one, uh, give me, the, the one thing if you could solve that, then retention would be fixed. It's a really complex situation and a complex problem with factors from everything from uh, feeling connected to campus, having friends, doing well in your studies, um, having enough money, financial issues are a big part of retention. So while I can, we can assume that there are many factors that affect retention, my third bold claim is that it fundamentally is everyone's responsibility on campus to contribute to our student success and their hopeful retention. Um, and with that being said, there are, for each of us, everyone on campus, we have sort of a sphere of influence as to what we can actually control and what we can directly um, influence. So while uh, there are bold initiatives going forward, very large initiatives on campus in general, I also think it's important for each of us to do what we can with the, um, the sphere of influence that we have. Now, my corollary is because this is such a big problem and uh, affects so many facets and pieces of our campus, it's really important to have tools that can help us. And technology is one of those pieces that can help us make a difference with our students. However, most of the research in the area of retention says that it really requires a personal touch, that students need to know people, they need to be connected to people, and they need to feel that the university as a whole and their advisors and faculty in specific really care about them and their success. So today we're going to focus on ways that you can improve student retention using Blackboard, but the key is that all of these are technology tools that can help you connect and communicate with your students. I'm drawing my inspiration for today from actually one of our newsletter articles that was written last March called Tips for Teaching for Student Retention. And the address is there at our, on our blog. If you go to factdevblog.niu.edu and just search for retention, this is the first article that will pop up for you too. So it's pretty easy to find. I think it even comes up if you search niu.edu for retention. Um, this is a, a fairly complex issue. This is the list on, and the article are really around, again, those small things that faculty, instructors, and teaching assistants can influence directly within their classroom. So the tips that I'll, the general tips for retention that I'll discuss today come from this article. Obviously, what I'm going to focus on really is Blackboard. And before we get started talking about the specific features or ways that you might use Blackboard for retention, I want to talk about Blackboard in general here at NIU and really consider why I would recommend that you, you do certain things in Blackboard because it's just a tool. The primary reason that I think Blackboard has a lot of influence on our students in terms of retention is really because of its usage. So we've just gotten from the Division of Information Technology 
the Blackboard usage statistics for fall 2014, right now. As of now, 96% of students are using Blackboard, 92% of instructional faculty, staff, and teaching assistants are also teaching and have at least one course that they're using Blackboard for. That accounts for 63% of all course sections, which seems kind of low, but that does include things like independent studies or um, independent research, where it, there may not be as strong of a use case for using Blackboard. Overall, this comes out to being almost four and a quarter course sections per student that's currently in Blackboard. So my argument here is that students are using Blackboard heavily, and as faculty, we are encouraging students to use Blackboard. We are, in many cases, requiring that they use Blackboard. So it makes sense to me that because of this broad usage, that Blackboard is a tool that we should consider when we're looking at how to impact students and retention. And I want to give a, a brief shout out. Tracy has posted the link to that blog post I mentioned into the text chat. Thank you very much, Tracy, for doing that. The other component of Blackboard that we're seeing a strong use for is Blackboard Mobile Learn. This is a mobile app that students can install on their smartphone or tablet and use that to access their Blackboard courses or organizations from their mobile device wherever they are, as well as receive notifications about updates in their courses and use the tablet or smartphone to actually participate in course activities. I pulled these statistics yesterday. So as of yesterday, from August 18th through September 18th, we had actually seen 13,000 unique users so far this academic year. And classes here at NIU started on the 25th. That was the Monday that classes started. You can see actually usage ramping up even before classes officially started. And you can see the continued use across these first four weeks of classes. I also like these statistics because it can tell us when students are logging in with their mobile devices. So we can see that the strongest use is on uh, really Monday through Thursday of the academic week. And the use starts as early as uh, 5 or 6 o'clock, but heaviest use is between 7 a.m. and we'll say about 1 o'clock before it dips a bit and then dips a little bit more overnight. Um, but we are seeing very strong usage of the mobile app in order to engage with and interact with course activities. 13,000 unique users with on September 18th, there were actually 6,000 logins on the variety of devices. Uh, really means with 13,000 unique users, that's over half of our student population, even when you account for the fact that some of these logins are likely to be faculty, staff, and teaching assistants. We don't have enough of those to um, push that number down significantly. So tips for improving student retention. I have seven tips and an for retention and a number of strategies that you can incorporate in Blackboard to support each one. Uh, I'm not going to do any live demos, but I've taken screenshots of many of them, particularly for tools that you may not be familiar with in Blackboard. For more information on anything we discussed today or any features of Blackboard, I would recommend you go to niu.edu slash Blackboard, and I can put that in the text chat, I think. It's quick enough to type. This is our Teaching with Blackboard site where we provide documentation, steps, tips, and tutorials, video um, tutorials on how to use Blackboard in your teaching. So please do follow up at that site if you have any questions about the features or the suggestions I make today. Tip number one is actually the very first tip from that blog post, too. And that is really getting to know your students. The rationale for this in the, the research on retention is that students report that they're more likely to stay, and students who leave more likely report that they do not feel like they are connected to their campus. So an important facet of retention is helping students connect to you as the professor and connect to the other students who are in the course. 
one of the ways that you can do that is getting to know your students on a professional but personal level. One of the easiest ways to do that, I think, is conducting a survey with Blackboard at the beginning of the semester to ask the students about themselves. You can certainly do this with paper cards as well, maybe give them a worksheet or ask them to take out a sheet of paper and answer a number of questions. But with Blackboard, the results are aggregated for you in the Grade Center. So some of the things you might ask about in the survey are the student's history with the content. Um, I've often asked students when I was a math teacher about how they felt about math, what experiences did they have about math, uh, as well as what prerequisites they had. Uh, how many credits they're currently taking, how long they've been at NIU, if they've used a variety of technology tools that you might require for the course, particularly Blackboard tools, uh, what their study habits might be, particularly around exams, their learning preferences, and any other outside commitments. Um, again, in the retention research and student research, a lot of the students in our classrooms now are no longer traditional students who are full-time uh, students alone, often they are also working or they have families, um, either children themselves or caring for parents, that are additional commitments that they balance with their school life. A few other suggestions besides creating a survey would be to use a get-to-know-each-other type discussion forum, whether it's an icebreaker or um, an introduce yourself sort of a forum um, that can allow students to do more of a narrative, almost a, an autobiography, briefly, on a discussion forum about themselves. The benefit to this is that then the other students can see and read that and get to know that student as well. Although I will say, um, with a survey, I often also post the results into the course so that the students can see what um, how they relate to other students and find maybe similarities that they all share. And then my last suggestion is to either take photos or request that students send you photos to create a class photo roster in Blackboard. There's a, a, a social profile tool that um, we're still working with IT security to see if it is really safe for us to turn on since it does pertain to student data and we don't want to do anything that would be unsafe. But in the meantime, until we have that tool on so that student photos are embedded directly into Blackboard, you can do that yourself. Here's an example I created with our guest accounts. Our training courses are celebrity studded to say the least. And here I created an item in Blackboard with a table that had six columns and then added a photo that was 100 pixels wide for each student and just placed their name underneath the photo. Um, if you do meet face to face, you can actually take photos that first night and use those photos yourselves to upload or you can request that students email you that photo in lieu of taking one yourself. And that gives you a way for you to study students' names and identify them, as well as give students a way to learn who their classmates are as well. Uh, you can, outside of Blackboard, if you didn't know, you can actually download student ID photos from my NIU uh, in most cases. If they have an ID photo taken and if they haven't suppressed their directory information, you can, as the instructor of a course, download those photos from my NIU. And there are instructions on our website, the Teaching with Blackboard site, and instructions on the ERP training site for how to do so. But I certainly wouldn't post those photos in the course since ID photos kind of equate to driver's license photos, and I certainly don't want my driver's license photo advertised out there. Are there any other suggestions from the group um, on how to get to know your students using Blackboard? I'll pause for a moment in case anyone wants to type something or if anyone wants to take the microphone, just raise your hand. I see at least one person typing, so I'm going to take another drink and pause while we wait.
hopefully you're close to them typing. Oh, now there are two people. It's a race. Who gets done first? That is a great suggestion. It's an interesting take on the icebreaker uh, forum. Isabel suggests asking them to use the voice of their pet to introduce themselves. I like that. That's an interesting take on rather than just tell me about yourself, tell me what your cat would say about you. Interesting. Great suggestion. Thank you. So tip number two is to design your course syllabus and really I would say your overall course to be welcoming to students. This tip on the blog comes out of the fact that many times our syllabi are are heavy on penalties, right? You must be to class on time. You must attend class or I will take away points. You must turn your, your assignments in on time. You must use APA style. Uh, and it's, it's very heavy on you have to and if you don't, then I'm taking off points or I will remove you from the class or we will contact the Office of Student Conduct. Um, so when you can work in the positive side of things, that I think helps them feel more welcomed and less punished. I would say when you're using Blackboard, this extends beyond just the course syllabus to cover the entire course in the way that you design it. So for example, when you post your syllabus, I would imagine that most of you post your syllabus as a PDF or Word document for students to download. And that's certainly effective. It's a good way for students to get the information save it, print it themselves, and I would definitely recommend continuing doing that. However, if you also add the content directly in Blackboard as separate items, that helps students find the information a little bit quicker than coming into Blackboard, downloading the syllabus, and then scrolling through a Word document. Uh, it's just a little bit easier to read and a little bit more accessible to them as well. This also shows up really cleanly in the mobile app so that they can open up their phone, find the information that they needed, and move on. So here's a screenshot of how it looks in a course that um, I recently taught. Notice I have at the very top a downloadable printable syllabus. That would be a PDF version of the syllabus. And below that, a downloadable and printable course schedule, which is the, the table of each week what we're going to cover and what the um, assignment is for the week that's due. But then below that, I've created these individual items, each of these catalog description, course objectives, each of these are separate items where I've entered text into the text box editor. By doing that, I get granular control over how they're placed and I can let students come in and read the syllabus without having to download it. Here, actually, a scrolled down perspective. I've added information on the textbook, including a photo of it. Uh, this is using the text box, or the, sorry, the text box, the textbook tool that's in Blackboard. You can actually search for your textbook by title or by ISBN and add information on it here. There also then is a folder with the readings and guidelines, a link to where my course videos are on YouTube, the topics and schedule, etc. It continues down the row with all of the information, including the grading scale and the assignments that's in the syllabus. Of course, I also, as I said, submit also and post the PDF version so that students can print that if they'd like to or save it and keep it on a flash drive or on their computer. The, another way that you can design your course to be welcoming is creating a welcome or start here area in your course and setting that to be the course entry point. I actually really like the home page that is the default course entry point in Blackboard. It, the modules pull in information based on due dates and upcoming assignments, uh, tasks that they may have, announcements you've posted. But if you aren't using a lot of those tools, it's basically a dead page. I think that quite often, at least at the beginning of the semester, it would be more helpful to bring students to the, a, a hub where you have a welcome statement, maybe a video that you've posted where you personally welcome them to the course. Maybe you've 
designed a course banner that displays over that area as well. And it creates a, a better sense of coming in and joining your course. So here is my welcome start here. It's not super exciting, I'll admit. You could be far more visually creative. But this welcome page lists the important information for the course. I have some tips for getting started, as well as a, a sort of an at-a-glance guide and syllabus to the right. I will admit I did not come up with this. This is a standard page that's used within the online programs in the Department of Educational Technology Research and Assessment. So I make no claims to its origination. Um, but I thought it was a great idea and used it. So I feel like I get some credit for recognizing someone else's brilliance. Um, but some sort of a page like this where you're welcoming them into the course and giving them a high level overview is perhaps more effective than a to-do module that doesn't have anything to do. And then my final recommendation to help your course be welcoming and friendly to students is to design your course so that it is mobile friendly. I'm not going to go into many details on what that means. Uh, we have resources on our website for designing a mobile friendly course, as well as we periodically offer a workshop uh, that covers all of the facets of being mobile friendly. But the reason, again, that I recommend this is because of those statistics, because of the use that we're seeing of the mobile app, it suggests that students would be best served if we created courses that were easy for them to consume in that fashion. So some of the features you could use and be aware of with the mobile app is uh, things like the announcements show up easy to read and uh, interact with in the mobile app. Students, one of the most used features of the app is their grades, being able to check in and see uh, what grades have been posted recently and what your feedback was. Uh, the discussion board, in fact, for that matter, most of the communication tools, the discussion board, blogs, wikis, and journals, all four are actually really, I think, convenient to use from the mobile app. Students can post back responses from wherever they are, whenever they are. And I think there are some really good implications outside of being welcoming to students for things like on-site reflections, where they can actually post to their journal about what they're engaging in at that moment. And of course, content. This is kind of a cutoff view. But students can, of course, read content, watch videos, and um, navigate websites, any of the materials you've posted in the course that are mobile accessible. So things that don't use Flash or Java um, are really the, the best things to use. Plain HTML images, videos work wonderfully. Um, and that lets students participate more frequently with your course. Because if they are taking the train back home for the weekend or um, sneaking in a break at work, they might be able to come in and read one piece of your content or uh, watch a short video if you've designed your course to be mobile friendly. And I think the more often that students engage with your material and engage with your course, the more likely they are to be successful and the more likely they are to be retained. And then the last component of the mobile app that again, I think is really important to students, are notifications. So they can actually configure their app. By default, it will give them a notification every time new content is posted, new announcements are posted, or uh, grades are posted on their phone, on their tablet. So when you post that announcement, they may get an email, but they'll also get a little pop-up on their phone. So again, that pulls students back in more frequently to the course content and makes them avail aware of the resources that are available. Tracy also points out, yes, the Collaborate mobile app is a fantastic way to keep students engaged from wherever, whenever they happen to be, because they can use that Collaborate app on uh, any iOS or Android device. Absolutely, and thank you for pointing that out. So tip number three, prepare your course content using a variety of modalities. This gets into a lot of issues around learning preferences, 
uh, disability and accessibility of your material, universal design, uh, motivation, technology limitations. Uh, there are a lot of really good reasons to be careful about the media that you use, the, the types of media and the format that you post it in. So some of the things you might consider uh, with using a variety of modalities are really the one of the primary things to think about is how you post video. If you've used video content, uh, there is a video tool in Blackboard where you can create content and add a video, but that's really now about the worst way that you can post video. Blackboard's not really designed for streaming video, and we have better tools. So for example, if you've created a YouTube video or you've just found a YouTube video that you want your students to watch, you can embed those with a mashup. And the reason why we recommend embedding with a mashup instead of just posting a link is that the mashup plays directly within your course. So students don't link out to YouTube and then have to come back and find their way back to your course. It also, this mashup tool is keyboard accessible. So students who may not use a mouse, who use a keyboard to navigate the web, can still easily play and view the videos. And the mashup tool is also very compatible with the mobile app. An interesting experiment to try, I'm doing it right now, is to record weekly introductions to your course with the Video Everywhere tool. That's, um, I'll show you a screenshot of it in a second. It's a small button in the text editor, and it launches a window to record from your webcam, and in the background, saves it to a, an unlisted private video in YouTube so that students can play it in their course, but it's not visible outside of the course. And I think it's a great way to connect to students, let them get to know you in a, a little bit less formal way, but also get them excited for the uh, coming week. And then I'll also show you how you can use a new tool called Helix Media Library to post video content that you've created into your course. The Helix Media Library connects with a server that IT maintains that is really optimized for streaming video. Uh, it will convert it so it plays on multiple devices from a computer or a laptop or a smartphone um, and plays it in a smooth, uh, seamless manner. So when you're posting video, if you want to try video everywhere, for that, you would use this small webcam icon in the text box. This t is available anywhere that the text editor is visible, so you can actually record videos to exams or assignments for instructions. Students can record videos themselves on the discussion board. Uh, essentially, anywhere that that tool is, you can add a video, and it really opens up the possibilities. What that opens is a window like this one that's not me. This is a default screenshot from Blackboard. Uh, but you can then start recording and record your video to upload it to YouTube in the background. The Helix Media Library is another component of this mashup tool. So you'll see under mashups this YouTube video that I mentioned. Down below that is the Helix Media Library. And the Helix Media Library will stream up, uh, allow you to upload video or audio to move to a server that's optimized for cont containing that media. Uh, again, you have access to this and students have access to this, so you can upload video for content like the sample lecture video in the call out to the right. You can ask students to create videos for an assignment and upload that to you as their submission. The videos are uh, on a server through IT. They are firewall password protected so that they cannot be seen by anyone who you do not give permission to. There are a variety of settings for permissions. Uh, so they are not publicly available, which is fantastic too, unless you make it. You could make them publicly available if that was helpful. So Isabel, the Video Everywhere tool can only be used for video, but this Helix Media Server, the Helix Media Library, can be used for either audio or video. And then another suggestion for using a variety of modalities is not to recreate things yourself, but to use open education resources. And if you're interested in that, I'm going to refer you to Tracy, because she's become our OER expert. 
Um, but in Blackboard, there's a brand new tool that was just launched um, this last year called Explore, the cross-platform learning object repository. And you can use this to find content that's been created by others and add it into your course for your students to interact with. The content that's created here is licensed under Creative Commons. So it's created with permission for you to use it for your courses. Tip number four, moving right along, is using, using success markers to track not only at-risk students, but really any student who might be at risk. Using at risk students to me always sounds like we've pre-identified students who might be at risk. I would say using these markers to track students who may be at risk based on what their performance is in the course. So one of the easiest ways, one of the biggest success markers for really being successful in the course and for retention in general is that students are actually attending. So you may take attendance in class or not. If you do, you can track that in the Grade Center. There's not a great tool for doing so. Uh, you have two options. One is to create a column for every class session and mark down who's attended. That's the most thorough, but you end up with a lot of columns. Or create a single column that adds text as the display. And using that, then you can type in the dates that students were absent uh, as opposed to tracking every time that they attended. And what I think that helps with is in the communication. It draws attention to students so that they know that they've been absent. And you'd think they know they were absent, they didn't show up to class. But they may not be realizing how that's accumulating over time. And because of that, what the consequences could be, both if you have an attendance policy and they're going to lose points, or just because they're missing a lot of material. A second tool that you can use in Blackboard to track students who may be at risk is the item analysis. Item analysis pertains to tests that you've deployed through Blackboard, and you can use it to find questions that students maybe struggled with, questions that students, most students got wrong, but it also tracks other statistics like discrimination index uh, as well. So here is a screenshot of the um, item analysis. Notice the top, there's a summary of all of the questions on the test. But the, the important piece for me is this difficulty rating and being able to see how many students actually got this right, what the average score was for students who completed that question. Um, the difficulty rating, the higher the difficulty score, actually the, uh, the better off you are, because that means that more students got it correct. Here, only 33% of students got this right. That, to me, is a red flag that students don't understand this particular question. Um, the other tools, like the discrimination index or standard deviation on the scores, can tell you other things about the quality of your questions. But that difficulty index in particular, I think, will tell you whether or not students struggled with this particular question. And then the final success marker I want to talk about, we're going to talk about for a while because it's so powerful, and that is the Retention Center. If you haven't seen it before, the Retention Center is in a number of places in Blackboard. You can get to it in the control panel of your course by going to Evaluation and then Retention Center. or in the global navigation menu, at the top of the screen, if you click your name to open up the, the global navigation menu, there's an icon that's two arrows pointing up and down. And that icon will tell you how many courses currently have students who might be at risk. If you click that, then you can get to see the detailed results for each of those courses. So here's the retention center. This is actually from the course that I'm teaching, which is why you see all of these hash marks. I, blacked out all of the students' names so that there's no student data here visible. Uh, but this is actually from the students that I'm currently teaching. So what the Retention Center will do is it tracks four key areas, whether or not students have missed deadlines, whether their grade is lower than their peers, if they have been participating in class, what their activity level is within Blackboard, and 
if they've actually even just logged in to Blackboard. That's what the access alert is. So those four areas will tabulate for each of your students to see whether or not they're at risk based on these indicators. So right now I have two students who have missed deadlines. I have one student who has a low grade. That's the grade alert. Uh, that means that this student's grade is 25% below the class average. I have 14 students in this list who have low activity. The activity is measured by the amount of time that students spend in the course. And if they're not spending as much time as their peers, that may mean that they aren't engaging enough with the course. Um, if you're not asking students to do much in the course, if you've posted a syllabus, then activity doesn't mean much. But in this case, students have to watch videos, they have to access readings, they participate on the discussion board, post their assignments. I actually have a fair number of activities for students to do. So, these 14 students are 25% below the average for all of the students in the course. They're probably not participating enough. And then the access alert will just simply tell you if students have not logged in within, five, within the last five days. Again, if you don't have anything that students need to access, this alert isn't going to mean that there's a problem, but it will still trigger. For example, on this access alert, if I click that, I get more details, and I can see that the last time this person logged in was seven days ago. That means it's been a whole week since they've come into my course. That might mean that I should reach out to them and notify them that they need to maybe come back into the fold. And in this case particularly, because of the grade alert and the activity alert as well, the student not only is not accessing the course frequently, their grade is low, they're not um, actually spending time here. This student very well may be struggling and need some additional assistance. I can also view the results for a particular student. And this shows me that this particular student has missed the deadline and has low activity. Um, I can see that their grade's actually still pretty good, but that missed deadline is still troubling. So from here, I can also notify the student. This notify is an email tool that lets me email the student about this situation. And if I notify a student and email them through the retention center, it keeps track of that here in this notification history. So if I needed to come back and see when did I email the student and um, what did I say to them, the regular email tool doesn't get saved in Blackboard, but these retention notifications do. And then one of the final aspects of the retention center I want to point out is if you do have a student that you're worried about. So that student that we just saw, after I notified the student, I was kind of worried that um, they may need a little bit more attention. So I started monitoring that student. That's what this star means. And now I can see that student's results right here on the page. So when I come to the retention center, I can see where that student stands without going in to see the specific details. Uh, that lets me keep a closer tab with them and follow up more if I need to. Then finally, the retention center tracks your activity as well. This is only visible to you, it's not visible to anyone else, but it gives you a dashboard view to see maybe where you need to um, interact a little bit more. So I can see that, for example, this discussion was a, a full week discussion, so I think I'm okay. But the first student posted seven days ago, and I haven't graded it yet. Now, when that seven-day window was over, it was actually seven full days of discussion, so now I can go in to grade their full discussion. But if this were a regular assignment, and they had, my student submitted it a week ago, and I didn't respond, then that's a failure on my part to respond to them and provide them with the feedback they need. I can also see where I've interacted on the discussion board, blogs, or journals, as well as see the announcements that I've posted recently as well. So this gives you a dashboard view to see how you're doing in terms of supporting your students as well. 
tip number five is providing students with opportunities to interact. And I know that sounds like it's a fragment because it's interacting with someone, right? But really interacting in general with you, with each other, um, with the community at large. And there are a variety of ways you can do that. One is um, to create a forum on your discussion board for off-topic discussion. Particularly if you're teaching an online course or you don't meet very often. Um, students don't use it heavily, but sometimes even just having the opportunity makes them feel like they could have been more connected if they wanted to be. You can also create groups if you're going to have students engage in group work. Creating a group in Blackboard gives them a few more tools that they can use to interact with one another. Again, they may or may not choose to use those. They may choose to use a, a Google document to collaborate or Hangouts or Skype or just text message. But again, creating a group gives them the opportunity to do that. And then another suggestion for what, even if you have a face-to-face -face course, whether this is online, blended, or a traditional face-to-face, -face, you may want to consider using a web conferencing tool for some of your office hours. And that's just because your students may not be able to make it to your office hours face-to-face. -face. So if periodically you held online office hours, then students would be able to join you, even if they were not on campus, to be able to ask questions and interact with you. Uh, one recent change to the Blackboard Collaborate building block allows you to, um, it automatically, in fact, creates a persistent room for your course. This room is always open and you don't have to schedule it like you would other sessions. So students can come here, you can simply say that Tuesdays at 2 o'clock I will be in this course room, come find me. It's also a great tool to suggest for students who may want to use that to collaborate with one another. You also now have, as the instructor of a course, as a faculty member, you have a persistent room as well. This room is across all of your courses, so you could use this for office hours, and any student in any course could stop by. You can also use this outside of campus by allowing guests, or use it with colleagues within NIU, whether or not you allow guests. But this room, combined with the course room, gives you more flexibility in what you offer. There are, of course, other tools that you can use. You may want to hold office hours with Adobe Connect or Skype. Google Hangouts, um, any tool that makes you more accessible to your students is um, a good thing in, in my book. Tip number six is to provide students with frequent feedback. Uh, on the blog post, if you look at this one, it's actually phrased as uh, assigning multiple frequent quizzes and assignments so that students get frequent feedback. But I don't want to focus on the assessment piece. I want to focus on the feedback. Um, anymore, when I describe the Grade Center to new users, I always explain the Grade Center as a communication tool, that this is about meeting and working with your students, letting them know how they're doing, rather than about recording and uh, calculating grades. That's a productivity piece, and that's important. But I also think it's important to think about the students in terms of, of sharing information with them. So some feedback options to consider. Uh, one is to create and offer practice quizzes in Blackboard so that students can test their understanding. Then you can show the correct answers and the feedback after some event, either after the deadline, the due date for taking it after everyone has taken it um, on a certain date. There are, now there are a number of options around how you provide that feedback to students. You also may want to have these graded or ungraded. Um, if you give your, your quizzes and tests in class, creating a practice quiz or test in Blackboard may not award students any points but it gives them an opportunity to try it, see what they got wrong, and go and look that up and study a little bit more effectively. For 
assignments in general, if you have students submit a paper, if you haven't tried out the inline grading or rubrics for those assignments, I highly recommend them. Inline grading lets you add comments and make revisions within the paper similar to track changes. And the rubric tool lets you use an interactive rubric in Blackboard to not only grade students, but then to provide that feedback so students can see how they performed. So the inline grading, here's a screenshot. Again, this is from one of my students. And you'll see that I've been able to select text, like this word databases, and add detailed feedback in a comment to the right. I'll be honest, I've provided a lot of feedback to my students, and I'm not sure how well they've taken that. It's overwhelming, I think, when you're not accustomed to that. So we've had a lot of conversations as well about how feedback is not necessarily a problem. It's not necessarily that they've done something wrong. It's just an opportunity for me to ask them questions or make some suggestions on their work. Here in the inline grading view, uh, at the top is this comment tool. That's what I used to make these comments. You can also draw on the page or highlight text. You can add text or strike out, actually cross out some of the text that they've written. The one thing you can't do is actually modify the text like you could if you had a Word document. If you want to do that, you can still use the button here with an arrow to download the student's paper, make your changes, and then you can upload your version with the track changes. But if you're going to focus on comments as opposed to actual revisions, this inline grading feature is fabulous. And then rubrics, this is a screenshot of a rubric. Um, for each level, I have the criterion and all of the, the levels of performance for that. When I grade, I can simply select the, uh, the level of achievement the student had for that item. And as you'll see at the bottom here, you can also type in detailed feedback for them based on w their performance and what specifically about this facet of their assignment you want them to adjust. So a lot of really great functionality around the rubrics in particular. Uh, if you're interested in rubrics, I want to highlight that in our October schedule that came out earlier this week or that you can find on our website, we will be offering a workshop on writing rubrics in the first place, using rubrics for providing feedback. And after that, uh, Tracy actually will also be teaching a workshop on using the rubric functionality within Blackboard, how to create a rubric and how to grade with a rubric. So look forward to that if that's an area of interest for you. And then the cool, new, exciting, interesting way to provide students with more feedback is a new tool in Blackboard called Achievements. Achievements lets you provide uh, badges and certificates to students based on their performance in the course. So you can award these for mastery or exceptional performance. Here's a screenshot of what that looks like. The badges are basically like digital stickers. Um, they can collect them in Blackboard and be proud of the fact that they've achieved mastery over a particular uh, facet or topic in the course, or uh, maybe they achieved this for being um, a fantastic facilitator and working with one another. Uh, they can also then, on some of these, you see this arrow pointing out. They can take those badges and publish them to a tool called the Mozilla Open Badges Backpack. And that backpack is a place for students to own and control and display the badges that they've earned from a variety of sources. So in that way, these not only become a way to give students feedback and motivate them to continue achieving, but it also becomes a portfolio item that they can use to demonstrate their proficiency to others. And it, it sort of dovetails into NIU's second mission right now, which is uh, promoting student career success, because that can be uh, one facet of how they promote themselves when they're trying to promote and attain a career. Again, achievements, we have a, a whole host of materials for on the Teaching with Blackboard site, since it is new and you may not have seen it before. And then tip number seven, this is our last one, 
encourage students to use support services. We all do this, I think. I would say that um, faculty as a whole do a great job of encouraging students to find and use support services. We don't necessarily do a great job of helping students find those themselves. Uh, and I think we can do that in Blackboard a little bit more effectively. So rather than having just a statement on your syllabus that says, students who need assistance with writing should contact the Writing Center, I would recommend posting those, that information directly within the course. Maybe having a content area devoted to support where students can go to learn more information about some of these services, such as who they are, what they do, who would be eligible to go, where that service is when they're open, how to contact them. And my favorite idea is actually including testimonials from other students who have used it, probably anonymously in case students don't want to admit to having been to the tutoring center, uh, but including that information about how another student says that this service helped, I think is a, an important aspect of that as well. That was a lot. Seven specific tips on how to uh, increase and affect retention from within your Blackboard course. Uh, everything from just getting to know your students, showing them you care, to actually tracking and monitoring their performance a little bit more so that you can intervene if necessary when you've identified a student who may be struggling. Um, while these are up, are there any comments that anyone wants to make about these tools or any of the suggestions that I made for Blackboard. And remember, excuse me, if you do have a microphone, feel free to raise your hand and I will turn that over to you. Excellent. Lori, thank you. I'm glad you appreciate it and you as well, Steve, the suggestions. Um, Regina, the inline grading is really very useful if you haven't used it before. I do want to point out, um, I would certainly not recommend trying all of these. <laughs> it's not as though the, the best thing to do for students is to implement every single thing that I've suggested here. For one thing, it's not an exhaustive list. There are so many other things that are out there. However, picking one or two that really speaks to you in the way that you work with your students, I think can make a difference. So what I would suggest is finding one or two tips either here or if it made you think of something else that you think would have an impact, try that. Try one or two pieces, get student feedback. Um, not, you don't only have to do a survey at the beginning and the end of the semester. Get student feedback throughout the semester so you can see where they're at and what else might help. Catherine, yes, the retention center for identifying the at-risk students is definitely more useful with more students. In a small course, it's fairly easy to pick out, you know the students' names, you know who's there or who isn't, but when you get to a, a critical mass of students, you can't interact, you can't spend as much time on each student. You can still know their names, you can still work with them individually, but the at-risk tool, will, the retention center, will help you identify who they are. Enjoy, you'll definitely hold some online office hours now. Great. Feel free to reach out if you want some help in using the tool. All right, if you have more questions about retention, I'm going to refer you to that article. Tracy posted the link earlier um, on our blog for more suggestions on teaching to improve student retention. And of course, our Teaching with Blackboard site provides a variety of tips and uh, all of the documentation you need to help you get started with any of these tools in Blackboard. And finally, you can reach out to me or any of my colleagues with any questions that you may have. We're happy to sit down with you to talk about how to use a specific tool in Blackboard or just to talk about your teaching in general. If you have a specific problem you'd like to address, let us know and we're happy to consult with you. With that, I want to thank everyone and uh, wish you the best of luck.